I want to ask you to take a Bible and turn to Galatians chapter 3. This morning we're going to be in Galatians 3 verses 8 and 9. And as you make your way there, I want to also draw your attention to the worship folder that I hope you received on your way in. I'd like for us, first of all, as always, to pull our Connect card out from the middle. If you're a guest of ours, welcome to Chapin Baptist. Thank you for joining us in worship. We would love to get to know you, so would you please consider putting your information on the front side of this card? And then on the other side, for everybody, guest and member alike, would you consider letting us know how we can pray for you, pray for your family, and you can either leave it in your seat or on your way out, you can put it in the offering baskets, and we appreciate your help letting us know how we can pray for you. Let me also point your attention uh, to some of the items in our bulletin. I want to mention some of these, and I want to pray over these as we also pray over the sermon. Uh, our fall conference is coming up October 11th through 13th. Uh, we would love to have you join us. It's going to be a wonderful time at Ridgecrest, and uh, we are going to look in the book of Job for a couple days. So I want you to be in prayer for that, and I would really love for you to consider coming. You can sign up at the senior adult table in the foyer. You can sign up on our Realm app. Lots of information there about the fall conference. I uh, would love for you to join us for that. Uh, let me also mention for college and young adults, uh, they are having a special night on September 15th, Greek night. They're going to be hanging out, eating Greek food, uh, getting in the Word. Uh, maybe they'll be studying the Bible in Greek. We don't know. It's Greek night, so we'll see how thorough they want to be with that. Uh, but that is going to be September 15th. So be aware of that. Let me also mention, as we did last week, uh, that our divorce care ministry is starting a new season uh, beginning September 11th. Divorce care and divorce care for kids will begin next Sunday. There's going to be a 13-week ministry session for them. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you need this ministry, or if you know someone that could benefit from it, uh, please, uh, please email us at info at chapinbaptist.com. And be in prayer for that ministry as well. Also, ladies, last thing I'll mention, ladies, uh, this coming Thursday, September 8th, At the Well meets. And in case you have not gone to At the Well, by the way, raise your hand if you've attended At the Well, ladies. Fantastic ministry. If you've not gone, it is a uh, a worship gathering and a fellowship gathering for ladies. Uh, They would love to see you there. That is this Thursday, 7 p.m. in the point. Be praying for Becky Presley as she plans on bringing the word from Isaiah 25. Lots of other things you can look at in there. I want to pray over these. Let's also pray over our time in the Word. God, we thank you for the worship we've already experienced. So Lord, I thank you for hearing your Word read. Lord, receiving the reading of your Word from an elder and and hearing prayers. I thank you for congregational singing. I thank you for congregational reading of Scripture. Lord, we we thank you that we can open Bibles now. and, And I pray, Lord, that you would... Uh, prepare our hearts to hear from you and to see what you have for us. Lord, I want to pray over these ministries. Lord, we we know that we have to make announcements and uh, and we have these items and many others going on, and yet we want them not just to be announcements, not just to be events, but to be used of you uh, for ministry, for your name, for your glory. So Lord, I pray for the fall conference that you would use it for your purposes, for your glory, that you would... Uh, Do a healthy work for our church family as we're able to gather, get away from the normalcy of life for a couple days, and then to think on the message of the book of Job. May may that be a powerful moment for the life and the health of our church. Lord, I want to pray for our divorce care ministry. God, I pray that you would, in your sovereignty, bring those who need that ministry, who need gospel healing, gospel encouragement, And Lord, I pray you would do yet again a powerful work during this session. I pray that especially for the kids that will participate, Lord. We know, uh, as we were told last week during the ministry spotlight, how this can affect kids for years. And so, Lord, we pray that you would provide gospel ministry for the young kids and help them to look at things through your perspective and be encouraged. So I pray you would anoint that team uh, that will do that ministry. Lord, I pray your blessings Thursday night at the well. God, I pray that you are worshiped. Lord, that your word is proclaimed. That I pray that you would foster fellowship among ladies, foster discipleship, maybe maybe foster mentorship relationships that can take place. 
I pray, Lord, for wonderful conversations around the tables and their discussion time. Lord, use that night. And Lord, we know there's many other things that we could be praying for. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, that you would draw our hearts to pray for the various things going on in our church family this week. And God, now I pray that we would hear well, that we would listen well. Lord, we really do believe that your word, that the Bible is your word. It is your revelation. And I pray that that lends a a wonderful weight to these next few moments together as we worship over your word. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read these two verses, and I, I want to encourage you to read them somewhat perplexed, to hear them with some perplexity. Chapter 3, verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So just a little over a month ago, I and three others from this church traveled down to Brazil. And the trip was basically two trips in one. The first five or six days we were down there, we went and did ministry with the churches that we know and that we've known for years. Got to do pastor's conference with them, got to learn more about what they feel God having in store. Very excited about future ministry with those churches Uh, with that organization, but we we intentionally built the second half of our trip to where we could meet someone we didn't know. We wanted to meet someone in the International Mission Board, our Southern Baptist International Mission Agency. We wanted to get acquainted with them. We wanted to learn about their ministry and, and just begin to explore how God might want us to partner through the IMB as well. And and I can just say uh, we are very excited about what that that may have in the store for this church uh, over the future years to come. Very excited about that. Now, as it just so happened, according to God's providence, uh, the people that we were connected to, missionary couple, in Rio de Janeiro. So we had to fly to Rio de Janeiro and spend about five days there for, for the Lord's work. And as it just happened, it just so happened that they could only spend one dinner with us, and it just so happened to be at a wonderful Brazilian steakhouse where it's all you can eat and they they bring by all this meat and however much you want and it was fantastic and and so it just so happened that we had like three full days to kill in Rio de Janeiro and as the Lord would see it our hotel literally overlooked the Copacabana and if you don't know what that is I've had a couple people say what's the Copacabana it's literally one of the most famous beaches in the world now I'm not a beach guy but I don't mind bragging about it from the pulpit, that we got to go and walk on the Copacabana, got to see the Jesus statue, and just kind of take in the sights and sounds of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, What I want to tell you about, though, is the moment that we set foot in Rio de Janeiro, we were picked up at the airport by a guy named Andre. He became our new friend for the next four days, and he, he drove us around. And Andre was given instructions to take us from the airport to a soccer stadium because we We were connected to, as the Lord would have it, connected to tickets with a professional soccer game going on that night in Rio de Janeiro. Now, I'm a sports guy. I'm not a soccer guy. I'm a college football guy. All the right teams won yesterday. Amen. Okay, so we appreciate good sports. And I appreciate sports enough to know, we have to admit it, that while we are in college football country, the world, it it belongs to soccer. What do they they call football. And if you know anything about international football, you know that Brazilians, they take their football seriously. So I was very excited about the opportunity to go to this Brazilian professional soccer team. It would be like going to watch the New York Giants. It was one of the teams in Rio de Janeiro. And so we drove through Rio traffic, which will increase your prayer life. (laughs) And we get up close to the stadium. And I mean, it's just, it is a zoo. It is just this This crazy crowd all gathering. Traffic was insane. And we kept getting closer and closer to the stadium itself. And then our driver pulled left into where we're facing right at the stadium. And there are guards keeping watch. Because not just anybody gets past them. And so they walked up to 
the, the door. And, and I don't know a lot of Portuguese, but I heard a word that I figured out what it meant pretty quickly. Our escort, he said, we are familia. And the guards got out of our way and opened the gate, and we drove in, and we parked under the stadium. Now, you may already know this, but when you're parking under the stadium, you're getting a good parking spot. <laughs> we parked under the stadium, and then we were escorted into the stadium, and we were given wristbands, and, and we were familiar, and there were people standing watch at certain doorways or hallways, and as we approached with our wristband, they got out of our way and welcomed us, and we were escorted all the way up to the box, the owner's box, number one. And so then we go and we're watching this game and there's food for us. So we're sitting in the owner's box and watching this game. And then we find out that Andre, our friend, he tells us, he says, hey, you see that, see that guy behind you? So there's several rows of, of seats. And the guy behind us, he says, that's one of the players. He was injured. So we find out that injured players, they sat in the box we were in watching this game. So I'm like, oh, my goodness. And like we're, we're literally with professional soccer players. And then he says, he says, see that lady behind you? He says, She's Brad Pitt's ex-girlfriend. I mean, that's so cool, you know? And, and I'm like, Amy, you know, I'm trying to be nonchalant. Supposedly, this is Brad Pitt's ex-girlfriend. So she Googles, finds out it wasn't Brad Pitt's ex-girlfriend, Leonardo DiCaprio's ex-girlfriend. Still cool, not quite as cool, to be honest, but still cool. Still cool that we're sitting in a box with, with the, it's the owner's box, and we got all this food, and the, the players, if they're not playing, they just apparently wanted to come hang out with us. And then we have like celebrities, ex-girlfriends, and all that. And here's the thing. Uh, I wasn't in that situation because of me. I believe it or not, it was because I was in good company. Okay, it wasn't because of me. They didn't let us into the stadium because he said Michael Hall at the gate. I'm, and I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that Leonardo DiCaprio's ex-girlfriend, she wasn't taking a selfie with me and Amy in the background to brag to her friends that Michael and Amy Hall were there. Now, now maybe she did. We don't know that. But, 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 but I doubt she did, okay? I was there because I was in good company. I was there because I was connected to someone who was connected to someone who could get us those tickets. Familia. My desire for you this morning is that after we walk through this text and consider it, that you will walk away knowing that you are in good company, that you're with family in the faith. So what I want to do is try to understand four thoughts from this text. When I say try to understand, I want us to consider and celebrate. I don't think you really understand something until you've considered enough to where you can appreciate it, cherish it, and in our case, celebrate four thoughts from this text. Number one, I want you to think about this. I want you to really ponder this. Scripture saw God's plans and spoke God's words. Now, I've been intrigued. I've been waiting for weeks to get to this passage of Scripture. And the Scripture foreseeing. Now, you may remember learning about personification in English class. That's happening here. Scripture is being personified. Scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. And then it preached, Scripture preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. I want us to focus on a part of what we see here, namely that Scripture saw God's plans and spoke God's words. This is an odd thought. This is peculiar. This is perplexing. I want us to think about it. I want us to consider it and then celebrate it. So this is what we can take away from this thought about Scripture. Scripture represents God's thoughts. And it reflects God's voice. Would you do yourself a favor and just push time out from the rest of life for just a moment? Everything else you may have on your mind, and I get it. But you, would you just consider the, the power of this thought? That Scripture represents God's thoughts and reflects God's voice. Which means in the Bible, 
we see the mind of God and we hear the voice of God. So let me ask you, do you ever find yourself wishing that you knew God's will? Or do you ever wish that God would just speak to you in a specific way where you knew what he wanted to say to you or you knew what he wanted you to do or he would tell you which, which fork to take in life or how to think about a certain situation? Do you ever want to know God's will? Do you ever wish that he would speak to you? Well, Scripture gives us God's thoughts. It gives us God's voice. We can see the mind of God. We can hear the voice of God because Scripture sees the mind of God and gives us the voice of God. This is a, a transcendent thought to consider. Now let me give some very down-to-earth suggestions based off of this thought. Let me encourage you. This may sound too expected from a pastor. Don't let it be too expected. Let me encourage you. This, enc this encourages us to prioritize corporate worship. If we really believe that the Bible gives us the thoughts of God and the voice of God, that should inform how we approach corporate worship. That is why an elder came up here opened the Bible, and greeted us by reading from Scripture and then praying in response to that Scripture. This is why when we sing songs, you've heard this from me before, that we're singing songs that are based on Scripture, that are giving us an opportunity to respond to scriptural truth. This is why, and I told Matt this was timely, we didn't plan it this way, he told me, hey, today we're having a corporate reading of Scripture. I said that's very timely because I'm going to say a few comments about corporate worship. This is why we collectively, audibly, even if it for some of us feels a little awkward to have 200 some people reading out loud words from a screen, it's us vocalizing scripture that we believe represents the mind of God and reflects the voice of God, that we can see his thoughts and hear his words through scripture. I want to encourage you, let this text prioritize for you corporate worship. Let me add to say, you need it. You need to come together with family in the faith. You need the good company of a church family. And you need to hear and celebrate and respond to Scripture. Because Scripture is God's thoughts. It is God's voice given for us. Let me also encourage you to prioritize personal Bible reading. Again, this may sound so cliche from a preacher. Let me just point out, I don't often talk to you about reading your Bible more and more and more. I grew up, I grew up in a culture where it was like, you got to read your Bible more, you got to read your Bible more. We need, we need to read our Bible. But I don't want you to hear the, the message that you better do it more or else. No, that's often what I heard. Maybe that was my fault. Maybe I, that's not what was being said, but that's, that's what I heard no, we need it like we need food. Whether we realize or not, we hunger for Scripture. I want to encourage you, feed your soul with personal Bible reading. And just in case you've not developed some sort of pattern or discipline for that, let me just encourage you, maybe ask someone that you know for a suggested reading plan. There are all sorts of Bible reading plans. You can Google them. You can ask someone here. You can... You can consider your options. I would encourage you, don't try to bite off more than you can chew. But I encourage you to consider a reading plan. Or maybe, let me just suggest, if you've never just fostered a pattern of reading Scripture, uh, I would suggest maybe read the books of Luke and Acts together. Just start reading through them. The Gospel of Luke and then the written account of the Acts of the Apostles, both written by the same author. Very helpful to read through those. Let me encourage you, maybe... Maybe you need to pick up that notebook that Kyle Hunsinger put together for this Galatians sermon series. Pick it up. It's designed to be very simple. It's designed to encourage a very simple pattern of reading Scripture and just pondering it for a few moments and praying in response to it about five times a week. That might help you. If you, if you don't have one, just contact us at the office. We'll help you get one. Just something 
to begin a personal Bible reading pattern because you need it. Because it's God's word to us. Let me also just encourage a small group. That might be Sunday school. It might be a home group. It might be a mentorship group, two or three people. We just encourage all of these things because if we believe this about Scripture, it should inform all these aspects of our life. Scripture saw God's plans, Paul says, and spoke God's words. Such a peculiar way to put it. That's the first thought. The second thought is this. Staying there in verse 8. Scripture preached the gospel. He says, in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. The thought of scripture preaching the gospel has mesmerized me for months as I saw this text coming. Now, before I go into the meat of this point, let me just, this is in parenthesis, food for thought. If Scripture preached, then how should I preach? That's a, that's a heavy thought for me as a preacher. If Scripture preached, the word Paul uses is, is, is like seeing a word that would say beforehand evangelized or first told the good news. It's the word he uses. If scripture preached, that makes me wonder how I should go about preaching. I want to be faithful to scripture. I want to be clear with scripture. I, I want to believe that when a preacher is preaching faithfully to scripture, then there's a power in in Scripture, that the Holy Spirit has inspired that is inherent in that moment in a way that we want to be in awe of and appreciative of and certainly faithful to as preachers. That's just food for thought. Now let me get into what I want us to consider here about the fact that Scripture, Paul says, preached the gospel. First, we realize that the gospel is a whole Bible message. Paul goes all the way back to Genesis in his reference here. He's saying Scripture preached the gospel in Genesis. The gospel is a whole Bible message. I hope that you've picked up on that under the teaching ministry from, from this platform week after week. Is that we believe that the entire Bible is a gospel word from God to us. This means, in other words, that the Old Testament and the New Testament together give us the gospel. It's not either or. It's not no longer the Old Testament because we have the New Testament. No, the Old Testament and the New Testament under God's providence by his inspiration come together in this amazing cohesion of a gospel message. So the Bible that I want to encourage you to read more and think about more and, and worship more informed by, it's the whole Bible. All of it. Old and New Testament. All 66 books. Which means... I want this to be hopefully a very enlightening thought for many of you. The gospel is found, and I'm going to explain what I mean here, in every text. All right, it means that the gospel should be heard from every text of the Bible. Let me add a little bit here to help clarify. Every text has a relationship with Jesus Christ, who is the Word, John tells us, who is the fulfillment of Scripture, the centerpiece of Scripture, the end, the goal of Scripture. It is all driving toward Him. It is all highlighting Jesus Christ. Every single text in the Bible has a relationship with Jesus Christ. Simply put, it may be looking forward to Jesus. It may be reflecting on Jesus' earthly ministry. It may be looking back on Jesus' earthly ministry. It may be looking ahead to his return. Every passage of Scripture from every book of the Bible has a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the gospel is to be found there and to be heard in the relationship that that text has with Jesus. Now let me show you some examples from our text. Now this is the third main thought. 
The gospel promises blessing to all peoples by faith. All right, so the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. That is, a, that is a summary, an aspect summary of the gospel. That God would justify by faith. We've been hearing that doctrine for weeks now. So seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel before and to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. Our third main point is that the gospel promises blessing to all peoples by faith. Now let's use this reference, in you shall all the nations be blessed, as an example to see how every text of Scripture has a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now let me let you in on something intriguing here. Paul didn't quote one specific text directly. He actually quotes in a way where he seems to be conflating at least three different texts from Genesis, maybe even more. When Paul says, in you then all the nations be blessed, you're not going to see that exact wording in any one particular text, but you're going to see at least three texts that are reflected in this verse. If you want to, come with me to Genesis 12. We're going to be in chapter 12 for just a brief moment. Then we're going to go to chapter 18. Then we're going to go to chapter 22 briefly. This will be quick. Genesis 12. I hope some of you can kind of already know what this is. We've referenced it so many times over the years. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, the Lord said to Abram, whose name would later be changed to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. Now watch this. This is what Paul's referencing. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's one of the verses that Paul is referencing. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God says that to Abram when he calls Abram to do a new work. Genesis 1 through 11, the world is an absolute mess. God calls a man to do something new through that man, to do something redemptive through that man. And he tells him in that moment, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So think about it this way. God promised Abram a kingdom and a land and blessings to families all over the world. In other words, God is saying that there is a kingdom coming one day and there is a promised land for his people. And in Abraham, people from all the families of the earth will be able to experience this kingdom and this promised land. Do you hear hints of what you know about the gospel? Scripture's preaching the gospel. All right, let's go to chapter 18. Let's flip forward two or three pages. Chapter 18, I'm going to begin reading in verse 16. Let me set the stage. Abram has been approached by three visitors that we quickly realize they are God. Some sort of mysterious representation of God. Promising again that Abraham and Sarah would have a son against all odds. Listen to what is said in verses 16 through 18. Then the men set out from there. They'd eaten a meal, and they're fixing the head on their way. They looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. Here we are. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children... And his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. And then he goes on to explain. God shows that he's going to go inspect Sodom and Gomorrah to see if the rumors of their depravity are true. And Abraham knows this is not good news for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He has family in that region. And so you know, may know the story. He begins to negotiate with God saying, look, now you're, you wouldn't sweep away the righteous with the wicked, would you? And he says, what if you found just enough righteous? Would you destroy the whole city if there are enough righteous in there? God says, no, I wouldn't do that. God ends up destroying the cities. But not everybody died. Some people were spared God's wrath. So think about it this way. 
In Genesis 18, God executed his judgment on the unrighteous. Guys, that's part of the gospel. God executed his judgment on the unrighteous, but he spared those not because they were righteous. He spared those who were in relationship to an intercessor. And this intercessor happened to be someone who would be a source of blessing to all the nations of the world. Do y'all hear hints of the gospel in this? All right, let's go to one more, Genesis 22. I'll begin reading in verse 15, Genesis 22, verse 15. This is that excruciatingly marvelous chapter where God tells Abraham to go and sacrifice his one and only beloved son. And after Abraham shows that he's willing to do that, God spares him from that and instead provides a ram to be sacrificed. Genesis 22, verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. Look at this, verse 18. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So there again we see a text that Paul is referencing in Galatians. And in this text, Genesis 22, God's promise to bless all the peoples of the world through Abraham was reinforced after Abraham. Remember what that name reminds us of, the phrase father of a multitude. It's reinforced after Abraham was prepared to sacrifice his only beloved son who was spared by the substitution of a lamb. A ram is just a male adult lamb. So please hear the gospel that scripture preaches. God promises a kingdom and a land and blessings to all families of the world. And to bring about this kingdom, God will execute his judgment on the unrighteous, but he will spare. He will justify those who are in relationship to an intercessor who will be a source of blessing to all the nations of the world. God has secured this blessing for all the peoples of the world through the death of his only beloved son who became our substitutionary sacrificial lamb. The Son of God rose from the grave and is now our intercessor who continually represents us before the Heavenly Father. That's the gospel. That's the gospel that Scripture preaches. It's the gospel that we must preach. All right, fourth thought. The gospel offers this blessing to you along with Abraham. Well, I hope you know this. Remember, my desire for you is that you'll walk out of here in just a few minutes knowing that you are in good company, knowing that you are part of a family that in many ways began with Abraham, the father of a multitude. The gospel that I'm preaching, it's offered to you along with Abraham. Just listen. I'm going to read several verses from Romans. Don't worry about turning there. Just listen to this. For those of you that take notes, if you want to write down these references, this is Romans chapter 4, verse 16. And then I'm going to straight away read from Genesis, or Romans chapter 10, verse 8 through 13. So Romans 4, 16, and then Romans 10, verses 8 through 13. This is what Paul says to the church in Rome. He says it depends on faith. Okay, we know that from Galatians. It depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Not only to the adherent of the law, that was the problem in the church in Galatia, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. I know you're hearing that cheesy Sunday school song right now for those of you who grew up in the Good Southern Baptist Church. You're hearing that song about Father Abraham. I'm not going to sing it. I was dared to. I'm not going to do it. You know that song. 
Paul goes on to say this in Romans 10. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth, I want you to hear this to you, directed to you. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes, the scripture says this, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. This is what the church in Galatia needed to hear. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who will call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The gospel is offered to you along with Abraham and all of those who have the same faith that he had that culminates in Jesus Christ being our risen Lord and Savior. So I want you to consider where we began the message and where we are now. We began observing that Scripture gives us God's thoughts and God's words. And now we are at a moment where you must consider your thoughts and your words. Do you believe, consider your thoughts here, do you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus, his son, from the dead? And all the implications of that belief. If you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, you believe first that Jesus was crucified. According to Scripture, 1 Corinthians 15. And the Bible teaches us that he was crucified in our place as our substitute sacrificial lamb. And he was raised from the dead. He conquered sin. He conquered death. Which is why he can offer eternal life to you. So let the thoughts of God that we see in Scripture now confront the thoughts in your spirit. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God raised His Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead? Now consider your words. Will you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? We're told in Romans... If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Will you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? If your answers are yes, I want you to know this. You're in really good company. You are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And Abraham is sort of like our friend Andre. He, he's just taking us up to what really matters. You are in the very company of the one true God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And by that faith, you are in his family, the church. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me just encourage you before I pray. All I'm really asking is for you to do the work of of consideration. Bottom line is, can you deep down in your truest, most honest thoughts, in your spirit... Agree with the biblical truth that Jesus is Lord, that he has been raised from the dead, and that by faith in him, you are responding to the gospel. You are justified. You are declared right before Almighty God, brought into the church, the family of faith. When it comes down to it, that is all that matters So understand this, I want you to know as you walk out 
that you're in good company because you have faith in Jesus Christ. Now, while you're still just listening before I pray, let me say, if you do not know, you are surrounded by people who want to share with you. If you came with someone by their invitation, would you tell them you'd like to have more conversation about the gospel? If you don't know anyone, if you just basically stumbled in here and you don't even know how you found yourself in church and you're not familiar with any of this stuff, would you please do what you're capable of doing? Get on our website, contact the church office and say, I want to talk with someone about the gospel. And we'll talk with you, encourage you, and we will, not, we will not pressure you. We will not manipulate. We will encourage and we will share and we help explain and pray with you if you'll let us do that. Because we want you to be in this family as well. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you loved the world so much that you sent your son. You gave your son. Just as it was foreshadowed all the way back in Genesis, that you gave your son and you sent him to the cross and he willingly went to the cross. He died and he was buried. And by your power and your power alone, he was raised from the dead. He is now the, the firstborn among many brothers. This is the family of the gospel. And I pray, Lord, that we would know that we are in good company, that we are children of our Heavenly Father through faith in Jesus Christ, your Son. And I pray that even now, the way that we respond in singing would reflect that we believe in our heart that you raised him from the grave, that we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. Church, would you stand as we respond to the word this morning? Faith of our fathers living still In spite of dungeon, fire, and sword Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy Whenever we hear that glorious word Faith of our fathers hold your benediction, I want you to receive the words from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. I will modify it since we do not live in Corinth, we live in Chapin. To the church of God that is in Chapin, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, 
called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.